feed your head, engage your brain, and enter the mind's eye. Your one-stop shop for politics to paranormal and everything in between. I'm your humble host, DJ BJ Turnov, and you're listening to The Mind's Eye on Z Talk Radio, the best internet talk radio, period. It's time to reanimate ourselves from the dead of winter. Another gorgeous evening in L.A. on this February 15th day. And I hope you see the same thing looking through your window because because I know you definitely see something beautiful every time you look in the mirror. I don't know, maybe I'm just buttering you up because it's the day after Valentine's and I may have forgot to send you flowers. So consider this episode my little love letter to you, schnookums. Or maybe I'm just plain giddy because the Mind's Eyes just celebrated our fourth anniversary. We're almost 100 episodes in. And for those who have been listening from the start, God bless your little heart. Because you're a real trooper, starting, you know, sticking with us through all the different incarnations that we've gone through. And I hope you're excited for what the next four years brings. And we're going to start that tonight with a double dose, two hours for the 200th anniversary of Mary Shelley's classic Frankenstein or Modern Prometheus, one of the most influential books on the science fiction genre. We're going to take an alternative look at the classic novel. Was Shelley really inspired by a dark and stormy night telling ghost stories? Or is there more to a tale of a man who created a monster? Is there some science fact amongst the fiction? Chemist and author Catherine Harkup steps into the Mind's Eye Laboratory to experiment with answering these hair-raising questions, which is also addressed in her brand new book, Making the Monster, the Science Behind Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Dr. Harkup and I, we're going to examine the 18th and 19th century science and scientists that influenced Shelley's most famous creation. You'll hear a few stories about the sensational science demonstrations of the time, which caught the imagination of the public, including experiments with electricity on human cadavers in the public forum. I know it sounds a bit abhorrent, but many of our modern achievements are actually a direct result of these scientists who conducted their pretty gruesome experiments on the dead. And even if we are still a bit far from being able to recreate Victor Frankenstein's monster, scientists are still trying to create the building blocks of life. Is the dream of creating life from nothing tantalizingly close? I mean, how close are we today to legitimately bringing people back from the dead? Ira Pastor, CEO of BioQuark, which is a life science company, uh, will join us in the second hour to tell us how close we are to fulfilling these once absurd dreams. BioCorp's mission is to give people a second chance at life by conducting cutting-edge science experiments in regeneration and reanimation of the brain and body. You'll find out exactly how they're doing it in the second hour, right after our next guest and the first guest, Dr. Catherine Harkup, on Making the Monster, the science behind Frankenstein on the 200th anniversary, coming up in a Mind's Eye moment on Z Talk Radio. We're back. You're listening to The Mind's Eye on Z Talk Radio. I may have blown a little bit of a nerdgasm this past Sunday, geeking out at the 51st Annual Antiquarian Book Festival in Pasadena. You heard right. That's an actual thing. And I don't know if it's synchronicity or coincidence, but this year's theme just happened to be celebrating the 200th anniversary of Frankenstein, just like we're doing tonight. Being based in L.A., uh, we're, we're pretty lucky here to have access to some of the best institutions in the world. One of them being Occidental College, which just so happens to have a first edition uh, in their collection. And really not too many of those left, particularly in that type of condition. Luckily, I snapped a picture for you. Remember, this is my love letter to you. Take a look at our new Instagram page. It's there now. Uh, same deal as all of our other social media. Uh, the name is at Minds Eye Show. And as you know, Instagram is really just a pictorial representation of the show, but and it doesn't really give any and it doesn't give any new news or access to our show archives or any information about our guest. Uh, if you want that information, just go to our Twitter handle at Minds Eye Show. Uh, same deal on Facebook. But while you're on Twitter, uh, don't forget to cast your vote in this week's poll. Would you want to be reanimated from the dead? And there's only two answers: yes or no. People. Please, no weird comments like, only if I could be reanimated uh, with my dead pet mouse. I mean, and that's, I wouldn't be surprised if we got something like that, knowing our listeners gotta love you guys. 
And there's no better time to cast that vote now because we're about to hit a commercial break. While you're casting your vote, I'll show tonight's guest, Dr. Catherine Harkup, a picture of that first edition. I know she'll geek out just like I did. We'll be right back with that good doctor taking an interesting look at Mary Shelley's life and the scientific ideas relating to her classic novel, Frankenstein. We'll be back. Join us then. This is the Mind's Eye on Z Talk Radio. Our explosive guest tonight is Dr. Catherine Harkup, whose skills as a chemist are only matched by her ability to communicate science. No doubt, a huge freaking nerd. Luckily, those are welcome here on the Mind's Eye. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, Doctor. Thank you so much for the invitation. Now, listeners, I, I do have to tread a little bit lightly tonight because uh, the good doctor is someone who knows a little too much about poison, so I'm praying I don't really uh, F up this interview and piss her off, piss her off too much. Uh, because about once a month, The Guardian publishes a poison-themed blog uh, from Catherine. Tell us a little bit about it and... When can we expect the zombie apocalypse? Because I think that's going to start from the poison. Uh, yeah, there's lots of poison theories about zombies, etc., etc. Maybe that'll be my ne- next blog post. Um, yeah, The Guardian um, got in touch and asked me to write on a general sort of poison theme. I think the editor there is a, a bit of a crime fiction fan, um, like me. And all, everyone loves a good poisoning tale. So I, I do my best to entertain and inform um, about the, the wonderful world of poisons and how to avoid them and uh, not um, get too badly off should you encounter them. <laughs> and is there one particular hair-raising story that, that you always remember or go back to? Oh, there, there are so many. Um, it is a, a rich field of terrifying stories, but perhaps um, the most terrifying of all the poisons, the one that keeps me awake at night, is uh, strychnine. Just the symptoms of this horrible, horrible poison. Um, it gives you terrible convulsions, and um, it, it kills you because the muscles of your lungs are so paralyzed that you can't breathe. It's an absolutely agonizing, horrific death. And it's not the sort of thing that you expect to find in, in cozy crime novels like Agatha Christie, but it's there in, in all its gruesome detail. Mm. And, and we brought the good doctor on to celebrate the 200th anniversary of Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, considered to be one of the most influential science fiction stories of all time. Uh, her latest book, Making the Monster, the science behind Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Give us a quick synopsis of, I guess, the prism in which you're writing the book, and I guess also tell a little bit about the book itself for those, I guess, who have who have been dead for the last 200 years and, and just got reanimated. <laughs> <laughs> um, the book is very much about trying to put Frankenstein, this extraordinary novel by an extraordinary woman, into some kind of context. It didn't spring from nothing. I was really curious about what might have influenced this uh, teenage girl to write such a brilliant tale and and launch science fiction um, novels, science fiction genre uh, from virtually nothing. So I was intrigued how someone with no formal education, women weren't expected to be scientists or, you know, take part in science at, at that time. So I wanted to know how she found out about stuff because what she writes about in Frankenstein is, you know, it's extraordinary extraordinarily close to what was really going on in some scientific experiments. It, it must have been unnervingly real to readers of the novel 200 years ago. And we're going to circle back to the, the, the science of reanimation in, in that part of the, the history of it. But I, I got to know right off the bat, I mean, in your time in the lab, have you ever played Victor Frankenstein, uh, try to raise something from nothing, reanimate something from the dead? Uh, tell us any anything any any stories like that. Oh, I, I couldn't possibly incriminate myself in such a way. But um, no, no, I, I, I have never been tempted to to re- reanimate or even dig up any corpses. It it sounds deeply unpleasant and um, best left to those who um, who know what they're doing. I, I'm very much more on the the killing side of people rather than <laughs> reanimating them from a poison point of view. Not that I do that either. But, oh, you know, obviously. 
<laughs> All right. Um, I'm a little terrified. I'm not going to lie, but uh, I think <laughs> I think <fine>. we'll, <laughs> for the good of the story and the good of the interview, we'll, we'll continue. Although I'm sweating a little bit, I'm not going to lie. Um, but I mean, you were talking a little bit. You touched on briefly how you know it really is remarkable that a 19 year old woman, uh, particularly at that time where women weren't really given education, uh, formal education at, at the science at the time, it really is remarkable how she can come up with what is now, you know, the, the one of the most classic science fiction stories of all time. And, and I can tell maybe a little bit, I mean, do you feel maybe a special connection to Mary Shelley? I mean, clearly there are differences between you and Mary, you're formally educated, uh, but there are, you can argue that there are a lot of parallels between today with regard to the state of women in science. I mean, do you feel a special connection there? Um, in a sense, yes. Uh, what is extraordinary for the sort of the turn of the 19th, century when Mary was writing, yes, women were effectively barred from the laboratory. They didn't receive formal uh, scientific training. However, they had a huge role to play in science communication, which is, is what I do full time. So there is um, a link to that kind of life. The women that um, Mary might have read or talked to and um, learned science from, these these women were hugely influential. There was a, a lady called Jane Marsett who wrote a series of science books explaining science to kids, and she influenced people like Michael Faraday. He became a scientist because he read her books. So women really did have a role, and w women are still um, performing that role. There's an awful lot of science communicators. Um, there seems to be m a better gender balance in science communication between men and women than perhaps there is um, in the lab. So yes, I think that role continues today and there are um, several parallels that you could make with that time. In the book, I mean, you do such a, a great job of biographical work on Mary Shelley. I mean, that in alone is is worth the book alone and it's so many heartbreaking and uplifting moments that you, that you really talk about. Um, and then you also discuss how a lot of them became inspirations for a story. Let's let's start with, I guess, let's start with the most basic. Where did, where did the the inspiration for the story for Frankenstein come from? It is perhaps one of the most famous literary gatherings in, in history. <laughs> the uh, Mary, um, her not quite husband yet, Percy, and Lord Byron were gathered together at Lake Geneva. Also there was Mary's uh, stepsister and Byron's doctor, a guy called John Polidori. And it was the worst summer on record. It was utterly miserable. It rained continuously. It was cold. There were lightning storms. They were absolutely bored out of their minds because they couldn't go out at all. So they sat around in the evening, huddled around the fire in June, and they tried to entertain each other. So they told ghost stories and scary tales. And one evening, Lord Byron challenged them all to write a ghost story. And from this single almost flippant challenge just to you know relieve the boredom came two of the most iconic figures of horror fiction first of all frankenstein's monster and john polidori created what we would recognize today as vampires you know the whole uh, vampire fiction of these elegantly dressed vampires who uh, aristocratic vampires who suck the life from people so it, it was a pretty impressive night and it was just <laughs> a, almost a throwaway remark yeah, it's it's amazing how in one night uh two of the modern classic you know science fiction stories were, yeah. were birthed it's 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 really amazing to think and also it, it something that also seems to happen i don't know if you've probably seen this as well that in in times of i guess great jumps in in writing in arts in any form seems that like a lot of the geniuses of the time or, or or those you know the heralded ones of the time they always seem to be hanging out with each other conversing and and doing things with each other absolutely i am absolutely astounded at the connections that mary shelley had as with her father her father was possibly one of the most famous men in britain um, in his day her mother was mary wollstonecraft the most one of the most prominent um well, she wouldn't have called herself a feminist, but you know, the feminist movement grew out of a lot of her work. So this was, when Mary Shelley was growing up, she heard people like Coleridge reciting his poetry you know, firsthand. 
Humphrey Davy, the great chemist, would wander by and chat to her father. There were poets and painters and politicians who would stop by to her, her family home. And that extraordinary connections that she had continued later in life. She was good friends with Byron. Uh, she had connections to Keats. It, it was... Uh, it must have been a brilliant life, even though, actually, personally, her life was very tragic. But it was very enviable in other respects. Yeah, a lot of lot of ups and downs. I mean, really just uh, emblematic of, of life of that time, and, and even just life in general, just the ups and downs, the things that she had to go through. Um, really inspirational stuff uh, on that end. And, and again, you did just a wonderful job uh, on the biographical work there. Thank you. She was an incredible survivor, I think, um, more than anything. I, I don't know how, you know, by the age of 25, she was widowed. She'd gone through five pregnancies and she only had one child living. That's an incredible burden for a young woman to have in her life. And she just carried on and made a success as an independent woman in a time when that wasn't at all easy. And, and you quote someone that, and I can't remember the name off him, that, that Mary Shelley, I mean, she embodies the English Romantic movement, which you know, was a product yeah. of, of the Age of Enlightenment. And you talk about that in the book. How, how did that carve out how did the Age of Enlightenment affect and carve out her writing, particularly with Frankenstein? Well, the Age of Enlightenment, quite apart from this sudden explosion of knowledge and wanting to educate the masses and spread information, encyclopedias were published, lectures were taking place, science was being discussed everywhere. There was an extraordinary pace of scientific advance in the year, about the hundred years leading up to the publication of Frankenstein, and it was almost week by week some um, incredible new discovery was made. The num just the number of chemical elements that were discovered in Mary's lifetime, it's only, it was around 30 elements in her lifetime. That's crazy. People were experimenting. They, the discovery of electricity as a, a kind of concept occurred only about about 80 years before she was born and in those 80 years they went from hey there's this cool thing we're going to call electricity <laughs> to building batteries that's that's crazy the kind of leaps that were going on so it must have been an incredibly exciting time to be living through all of those scientific advances but also terrifying if you don't really understand and keep pace with what's going on it must be really scary to hear of people trying to reanimate corpses and making frogs legs dance with electricity and some of the things that i guess we're kind of scared of now though reanimation of the dead is always um, it's something that we're, you know, people are scared of. I mean, there are differences of what people were scared of then uh, and what people are scared of now from the story, right? Oh, definitely. Uh, the, it would have had a, a very different, different resonance with her audience at the time. Uh, Mary was writing at a time when bodies were being dug up in the UK to supply anatomy schools. Anatomy was like the buzz subject for everyone to study. And there was a, a huge shortage of material for people to learn from. And so Britain had pretty much this unique situation of gangs going around to graveyards and digging up bodies. So when Mary describes Victor Frankenstein going to graveyards and charnel houses and studying life and death and uh, obtaining the raw materials for his creature. This was a very direct thing that people knew about. It was occurring around them. Yeah, I mean, that, that was a huge issue at the time, and, and that kind of translated to America, I think, uh, about 100 years later as, yeah, as well. Yeah, I think there was, um, I think it did occur in America. I'm, I'm not sure that it was to the, the same extent, but they had much the same laws about access to bodies for teaching um, medical students. And so, yeah, they, they would have had similar problems in supplying um, demand. <laughs> yeah, well, I want to talk about a little bit about some of the debates, I guess, of Frankenstein. And, um, mm. you know, she says, Mary Shelley, she says she got the name from a dream. Uh, but to me, her biggest influences uh, were f maybe from her times traveling. I believe yeah. she even visited a castle, Frankenstein, I think you, you brought up. Now, I mean, where do you weigh in on this debate? W where do you think her inspiration for the name was Frankenstein? Oh, Frankenstein, I mean, she did pass, um, I think, within a few miles of 
Castle Frankenstein. It is a real place. You might have seen it in films with a, you know crazy scientists creating creatures in um, laboratories filled with electrical equipment. Castle Frankenstein is a real place in Germany, and she sailed along uh, the Rhine just underneath it. Whether she actually visited, um, we can't actually prove. There's no evidence that she actually went to the castle. But it must have been the thing to talk about when you're in that area. It was the most famous tourist attraction. And there were terrifying stories of real-life scientists who lived in this castle and were doing all sorts of experiments on um, you know, human bodies and alchemy. It was really inspirational stuff. And it seems that she should have been inspired very directly by this. We just can't prove it. Um, it's too much of a coincidence not to believe that it did inspire her. And she was gathering inspiration from everywhere, even in her personal life. Do you think that there's one or two, maybe a family friend, a family member, or a friend that had a that were directly, you know, or indirectly incorporated into Frankenstein as a character or part of a character? Oh, definitely. I mean, Victor Frankenstein is very much a Percy Shelley type. Percy Shelley, in his youth, was obsessed, well, even into his adulthood, he was obsessed with science. He was always um, making little fire lanterns and setting them off, and he conducted his own experiments in electricity. He was described, as, I think it was something like uh, the alchemist in his cave, the wizard in his uh, laboratory, or something like that. He, he was called Mad Shelley when he was at school. That's a very, very easy um, direct link that you can make. She didn't have to go very far to look for her Victor Frankenstein. But there, lo there were lots of other people that she might have known in her childhood that uh, rounded out that character, people like Humphrey Davy. And certainly in her later work, works like The Last Man, which yeah, apart from inventing science fiction genre, she also invented apocalyptic fiction. And her book, The Last Man, has very definite Percy Shelley characters and Lord Byron characters. So I think she did have this very eclectic mix of things, almost like Victor Frankenstein picking the choice material to create her monsters. And you bring up The Last Man, and, and some people view that as a somewhat of a spiritual sequel to, the Fra to Frankenstein. How do you feel about yeah. that? Oh, no, I agree. It's very much in that kind of... It has a very similar tone, and it's very much a what-if. What if someone does know the secret of bringing something back to life? What if, if there is a, a disease that wipes out humanity? How does humanity cope with that and deal with the disintegration of um, a population? So, uh, yes, it's very much in a similar vein. And... It doesn't. Those two books don't really compare to her other work, which is uh, yeah, it's very very different. So those two are very much of a type. But sadly, the Last Man isn't nearly as read as Frankenstein. And you noted that uh, her husband was a, a bit of an inspiration as well. Does that mean that that Shelley ever had any laboratory time or experience? Um, he certainly was an amateur scientist. As, as the majority of scientists were in, in that day, he had his, um, he built his own battery or had batteries built for him. He had electrical equipment filling up his rooms at Oxford, even though he was only there for a very short time. And he burnt holes in the carpet. He he, um, he spilt all sorts of chemicals all over stuff. He was personally a complete mess. <laughs> he just spilt all sorts of stuff all over him. It must have been a very risky venture to have a cup of tea uh, with him in his room. So, um, yeah, he, in certain amateur sense, he did experiment. I don't think he made any groundbreaking discoveries or great contributions to science, but he certainly was passionate about it. And did Mary ever, I guess, have to clean up any of the, any of the, the messes that he would have to make, uh, you know, literally and figuratively? <laughs> uh, Mary had to clean up a lot of his messes, not necessarily his experiments. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> she certainly um, had to pawn his, some of his scientific equipment when they were particularly short of funds. Mm. So he hung on to that stuff even when they were fairly desperate for money, and it was a bit of a last resort to sell that stuff to make ends meet. So, yeah, she, she took care of him in, in many senses and cleaned up his messes. 
a, a truly an incredible woman and and let's let's just hold it right there for a moment we're gonna when we come back we're gonna go more into the, the really the shocking amount of truth behind the tale of a man who created a monster the science and scientists behind reanimations of the dead then and today when we come back with dr katherine harkup discussing her latest making the monster the science behind mary shelley's frankenstein we're back on the mind's eye with chemist dr katherine harkup talking about her book making the monster the science behind mary shelley's frankenstein uh, let's get into the real electrifying stuff here the science behind reanimation of the dead i mean that was something that was looked at even at the time of the publication of the book right oh absolutely it is astonishing how close mary shelley um, was talking about real science people really were trying to reanimate the dead not necessarily from pieces that they'd um, sewn together but there were very famous um, well-reported attempts to reanimate dead bodies of, of hanged criminals uh, in the uk in england and in scotland and that was actually a huge like those were big stories going around at the time of people surviving uh you know some sort of death and hangings were the big you know killing of the time so that was a lot of stories going around oh, right yeah absolutely it, um there was uh i think there's always been a bit of a fear of it's one of those primal fears of being buried alive and a lot of that might have come from the fact that when criminals were hanged um they, they weren't very good at it and occasionally <laughs> people survived the hanging process and you, well prosecutors were left with the problem that they'd been committed to be hanged until they were dead but they weren't dead so did they have to go through the whole process again or <laughs> were they allowed to live their lives and in many cases they they went on to live their lives uh, very respectably uh, the most famous case is a woman in the i think it was the 17th century she had been hanged she'd been left to hang for about an hour her friends had pulled on her to try and hasten her death she'd been punched in the chest to try and quicken her death it was a truly horrific experience she was taken to a house for um, autopsy and she woke up <laughs> which i i don't <laughs> know how um, she managed to survive it but two days later she was tucking into chicken dinners and asking for beer so <laughs> she seems to have come out of it remarkably well and so stories like that sort of inspired people maybe you could bring people back from the uh, what appeared to be a very recent death and people were genuinely concerned about trying to revive people who perhaps um, accidentally fallen in water and drowned or people who'd fallen from a great height and these experiments with electricity that seem to make muscles twitch and, and people breathe they thought well, this will be a brilliant way to try and revive people they just needed to prove that they could do it and so you know you don't often get the chance to uh, try and revive a recently suffocated or drowned person so some scientists waited for an appropriate hanging and <laughs> made the most of it which of course there are appropriate hangings obviously um well uh, <laughs> it was appropriate at the time at the time no um, of course it's all relative it's all culturally and in time relative to say the least yes. yeah when I, when I was reading about that case you were talking about uh the case of Anne green uh and green, green i think that's it. yeah i was just I, I couldn't believe it i i felt she was pretty much killed three times and yet somehow kept surviving uh um. i know and <laughs> the most my favorite bit of that whole story she'd suffered numerous indignities and beatings and oh she just had a horrible time of it and the last moment she actually made a profit from her experiences she would display herself <laughs> laying in the coffin she was supposed to be buried in and people would come and see her because she was a, she was a phenomenon and she made money from it and when she finally left and went on her way she took her coffin away as a, a token of her <laughs> survival i think she's a brilliant woman yeah that, that is the the quintessential story of making lemonade from lemons i guess that would, that would Absolutely. be <laughs> All right, so so let's let's talk about the real life inspirations for Dr. Victor Frankenstein, which you you briefly okay. touched on before. Um, why don't you go into maybe one or two examples who you think were a direct uh, inspiration for the doctor? I think probably one of the most direct inspirations is Humphrey Davy. 
uh, Mary Shelley would have known him. Um, well, her father would have known him better, but she would have met him as a child. She possibly went to his very inspirational science lectures at the Royal Institution. I mean, these things are still a phenomenon even today. He was so inspiring people. To, he basically caused traffic jams in London in uh, you know, 1802 when traffic jams weren't a thing. People were absolutely clamoring to hear this man talk about science. He was so such a brilliant communicator of it and he was doing experiments with electricity and using electricity to isolate new elements he was one of the most famous scientists in the uk at the time and his kind of brash attitude of he could do anything and you know he had he made all these stunning discoveries it's very much the attitude of victor frankenstein who has this sudden insight that all the other scientists have missed and he has this great power that he can use to reanimate and you know create life when and time and time again, you bring up that, uh, you know, this comparison. And in the book, I mean, we talked about how the Age of Enlightenment and, and kind of like the, the ethos of that in some level. I mean, do you think that on some level, Frankenstein is a critique of science of the time? Oh, very much so. I, I think it is um, a critique of the, perhaps the arrogance of many of these scientists. And particularly... Victor Frankenstein is very secretive about he, what he does. And the Enlightenment and people like Mary Shelley's father, William Godwin, they're very much about sharing their ideas and working together and collaboratively. Another in, possible influence, a guy called Joseph Priestley, who was a, a brilliant, what they used to call an electrician at the time, but a, a scientist interested in electricity. He was all about um, sharing ideas, even if he didn't have answers to scientific theories. He would put them out there and say, well, has anyone got any ideas? Has anyone got any suggestions about how we could improve this? And they were very open to it, whereas Victor Frankenstein was very, very secretive. Um, so I think that was part of maybe his downfall. He should have shared his ideas. He should have, before it got out of hand, so others could have helped him with it. So, yes, I do think it is a critique of certain aspects of the Enlightenment science, but actually, Peter Frankenstein science is very, very successful. He's brilliant. He creates life from a collection of bits. That's, and not just any creature. This creature is stronger, he's more resilient, he's more intelligent. That's a remarkable achievement by any standards. What goes wrong for Victor Frankenstein is how he treats his creature. It's not the, we see Frankenstein today as science gone mad or science gone wrong. That's not the feel of the book at all. It's what you do hmm. and how you treat your fellow creature. The science is brilliant. The science is successful. In the book, you bring up a really interesting point that never really thought about before that the word scientist didn't even exist at the time i believe of the writing of the, of, of the book i mean what were i guess were they referred to and how did they i guess you know how were they viewed well, they, as they were describing themselves as natural philosophers hmm. there was science wasn't really even a profession until humphrey davy came along it was something that you did because you were interested it was usually very rich people who had time on their hands and there was no real there was some government funding but nowhere near the the scale and um streamlined way that it is done today it was very ad hoc and pretty much anyone could pitch in joseph Priestley, even though he discovered elements he um made many electrical discoveries he was mostly a preacher That's, that was his day job he wrote books about education um so anyone could you know chip in and have a go so uh, this idea that it was a, a basically a bunch of amateurs <laughs> I, I use that term very very loosely it, it does sort of chip in with you know the idea that victor frankenstein just goes off and tries it you know, that's what they would have done back then. There wouldn't have been state programs of research. So, um, 
where am I going with this? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's, I mean, it's interesting that they call themselves natural philosophers because yeah. you know, it, it kind of spins Everything. it, the whole idea of science, in, in a different direction than the way that we look at it today. Oh, absolutely. It was, anything was up for grabs. Um, you know, you just, to, to wherever your attention took you, you could apply a scientific kind of methodology to it and, and have a go. So the idea of a scientist, um, the word was coined specifically to describe people who do science as a profession, the way that artists do make art as a profession. And initially, this idea that you, know, you would use the word scientist, though it was treated as a bit of a joke. But after a few years, it kind of caught on. And now it's such an ordinary, everyday term. I don't think we could contemplate, what, what do you call yourself if you're not a scientist? You're doing science. But they were doing natural philosophy, and it was just an interesting nature and everything around them and they wouldn't necessarily subdivide it into chemistry and physics and electricity it was just you know it was just the world around them and how it operated it sounds kind of loosey-goosey in many ways both good and bad yeah, very much uh, very vague in, in comparison to today with someone with your type of experience do you think that there's too much rigidity um i think it's um a shame that people can't um, pick and choose and um, broaden, the, I mean, there are exceptions, and broaden their research because you can become very, very focused and very, very specialized. I did find after my PhD, I knew an awful lot about a very, very, very small thing. And I am much happier knowing um, perhaps to a, sh a much shallower level, but a, a broader range of things. And I like the interconnectedness of stuff and making those links between even, you know, literature and science. Mm. And I think it's a shame that a lot of scientists appear to be very, very focused. I'm sure, you know, it has its benefits, but it, it seems to be um, a loss that you can't just go out there and research something for the sheer joy of it. And so we call them scientists today. Like you said, then we called them natural philosophers. Um, mm. And of Shelley's contemporaries, you you brought up a few experiments of the time, and, and there's so many of them that I don't, I don't want to go into all of them, obviously. don't want to ruin the mm. book either. But just bringing up one, just to give a, a little bit of a sample, I believe one person, the last name was Aldini, or Aldini. Uh, he was talking about human oh, reanimation. Aldini, yeah. You mind talking about the, <laughs> the, him a little bit and some of the experiments he was conducting? So Aldini was um, the nephew of a very famous scientist, uh, Luigi Galvani, where we get the word galvanism from, so anything that kind of energizes things. Galvani came up with this brilliant idea of animal electricity, and Aldini was out to promote his uncle's work. And to do this, he, he started off by demonstrating how electricity could make frogs' legs twitch, dead frogs' legs twitch. And this is fairly impressive for a short time. And then audiences get bored, as audiences do. And he went on to more dramatic demonstrations. And he showed how he could um, get the decapitated head of a bull and apply wires to the face of the bull and the muscles would twitch and move and the tongue would loll and the eyes would rotate in their sockets and it was all very shocking for a while and then audiences get bored. So he went on to human heads from decapitated criminals and um, even after that, that got totally out of hand and Germany had to pass a specific law saying, stop this, this is not science, this is just gross. Um, but that didn't stop Aldini because actually his real purpose, it wasn't to shock or entertain necessarily. He was involved in serious research. He did want to investigate how you could revive people who had recently suffocated or drowned. And so he found himself in London in, I think it was 1803, and he was looking around for a whole corpse. And because in England they hanged their criminals, and part of the punishment for murderers was, well, murder was a, a very... It's a very special category of crime, so it has to be a worse punishment than 
hanging until you're dead because if you steal a pig you'd be hanged until you were dead so you had to have an extra punishment and what can be worse a fate worse than death it's to be hanged until you're dead and handed over to a scientist so that's what happened um the body of george forster a convicted murderer was handed over to aldini shortly after he was had been cut down from the scaffold and Aldini started applying wires from a very primitive battery in an attempt to, well, first of all, experiments to see what effects electricity had on the muscles. But ultimately, he cracked open George Forster's rib cage and he applied the wires to the heart in an attempt to restart it. Quite why you want to restart the heart of a convicted murderer is beyond me, but um, <laughs> this was his aim. And uh, thankfully, I think on all counts, he was unsuccessful. <laughs> but if you listen to the description of these experiments, um, George Forster's arm in one particular experiment, it moved, the fingers twisted and contorted like he was playing a violin. Um, you know, eyes opened, muscle, he shuddered. It must have been terrifying. It is an awful lot like the image we have in our head of Boris Karloff on that slab, slowly twitching and groaning into life. Uh, I'm, I'm terrified now just thinking about it, <laughs> let alone 200 years ago, or at least now we understand about it, then, good Lord. Um, Absolutely. I, there is a, apparently one of those present, uh, the beadle of the Royal College of Surgeons died of shock <laughs> the <laughs> night after these experiments having witnessed them. I'm not quite sure that's true, but it <laughs> certainly had a, an effect uh, on the people who witnessed it. And it, It's interesting that now when we think of Frankenstein and, and the doctor bringing his monster to life, we think of um, that it was done by electricity, but I believe in the book it actually has nothing to do with electricity. Um, the doctor discovers an unknown element of life. Where did that discrepancy come well, up from? The annoying thing is, if you're looking to Frankenstein as a how-to guide to reanimate dead people, <laughs> you're going to be very disappointed because Mary Shelley is frustratingly vague on her scientific details. So um, she talks about a spark of life. And a spark can be pretty much anything. It can be a spark from a fire or it can be a spark, an electrical spark. But given the obsession that people had with electricity around that time, I think it's a fairly safe assumption that she meant an electrical spark, especially mm. when people were doing electrical experiments on dead bodies. What I don't think she was talking about was a lightning storm and kind of winching her, her monster's corpse up to a ceiling and, you know, all the stuff that we remember from the films. I'm sure that's just, you know, big budgets and trying to impress an audience with good special effects. But the idea that it is an electrical spark, I think that's certainly credible given the, mm. the science that was going on at the time. Okay, that makes sense. So I'm stupid, I guess it sounds like, more than anything. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so disregard that. Obviously, we, we've come a long way in our attempts to bring people back from the dead. Um, in many ways, we can attribute some of our modern medicine from the contemporaries of Shelley, of Mary Shelley, um, and some of their inventions and experiments. And um, How much do you think we owe to the Age of Enlightenment scientists? these natural philosophers oh, I think today. Oh, owe a huge amount to them. Um, just the fact that they were prepared to try this stuff and, and have a go. You know, experiments that you absolutely cannot do today. You know, it would never get past an ethics committee. Um, <laughs> but they did all of this stuff and they found out a huge amount. And the story of Frankenstein, what I love is that science fiction is very clearly very directly influenced by science, you know, the whole genre, not just Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, but also science fiction can influence science fact. And there was a, a guy called, um, I think it's Bakken, it's pronounced, uh, an American guy who remembered seeing as a kid Franken the 1931 Frankenstein film, and he remembered Boris Karloff kind of twitching and coming to life on this slab, and he thought, well, that's incredible. If you could get all of that electrical equipment and you could miniaturize it and make it smaller and you could control a heart rhythm, maybe you could save people's lives. 
And so he went away and he invented the first portable pacemaker. <laughs> so there's a very, very direct link from science fiction to science fact in that case. But in terms of what the scientists were doing in Mary Shelley's time, yes, there's, there's a direct lineage to the, the stuff that we do now, quite apart from the fact that back then they professionalized science. People like Lavoisier and Humphrey Davy turned it from a hobby into a serious um, skill and profession. So I think we have a huge amount to um, uh, to pay credit to those people that did that. And staying with, with today and, and the near future, I mean, how, how cl- there are, I believe, experiments that do revolve around reanimation of the dead and and bringing life from nothing. I mean, how close are we to either of those? Um, it always seems to be just around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the most famous, or the most well-known experiments at the moment relate to transplants and extending life far beyond what might have been expected a few years ago or uh, decades ago. Particularly the experiments of this um, this guy, this Italian uh, surgeon, who thinks he can do a head transplant. To I, If that doesn't sound like Frankenstein, I don't know what does. <laughs> but <laughs> he sees it not as a head transplant, but as a body transplant. And it's giving extended life to uh, quadriplegics who suffer a much shortened life because of deterioration of their organs. So you give them a complete new set and their head can carry on surviving. Um, So that keeps promising to be just around the corner. But as far as I know, he hasn't actually done it yet. And I'm not sure how successful he's going to be. I I hope he is. I really do. But I am, I'm sceptical. If he is um, successful, could that lead to future of possibly being able to live forever? With just being, you know, transplanting your head from one body to another? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure we'll end up with this kind of future on <laughs> scenario, just heads in jars, may, maybe. I don't know. Um, it's, it would certainly extend life for quadriplegics. And I don't know, eventually everything has to to wear out, I guess, even the brain. So I, I suppose you can keep supplying it with... Um, you're replacing faulty organs. But eventually, when do you stop becoming you? Hmm. Um, It's an interesting debate that I'm not sure that we've really had yet because no one's actually done the experiment, but it is perhaps something that we should be thinking about. When do we stop becoming us? Um, How many bits of us do we have to replace? If we ever do discover the ability to reanimate ourselves from the dead, do you think, should we? moral question, should we reanimate the death or dead, or is there a time for all of us? I don't know, we're always trying to cheat death, none of us actually want to die I don't think, there's certainly you know, we all exercise, we take pills, we, we take you know, smear creams on us to make us look as young as possible, but do we really want to live forever? I'm not sure, I'm not convinced that's a good idea I think we need uh, a renewal of our species to, to come up with new ideas and progress us uh, uh, as a, a, a species rather than stagnate with the same old people hanging around forever. <laughs> I get bored of them. I get bored of myself within five seconds, let alone <laughs> let for infinity. Jeez. Um, <laughs> but there's the scientific idea that energy can't be created nor destroyed. It can you know, only be manipulated or, or reformed in, in yeah. a matter. I mean, do you think it is possible, I mean, sticking with the idea of Frankenstein really kind of getting life from nothing, I mean, do you think it's even possible with within the parameters of that theory? Um, or even outside of those parameters, what do you think? I mean, do you think it's even possible to create think, life from nothing? Actually, one of the big, big challenges, one of the first challenges for science is to actually define what life is. It's hmm. extraordinarily difficult to just define what life is and what death is. Is. We kind of know it when we see it, but actually to give a rigorous definition 
Um, I've heard people suggest that life is going against um, chaos, so um, going against entropy and making more organized structures from disorder, whereas the, the rest of the universe wants to make disorder from order. In that sense, an awful lot of things around us might be classified as alive um, simply because we've put energy into organizing them. So, and actually that's an idea that Mary Shelley tapped into, the fact that if you have a complex structure and, and you assemble it and you correctly fit everything together, that kind of high level of organization creates life in itself, which is a very, very modern idea to be having 200 years ago. So maybe she was onto something in that sense. Um, yeah, whether it's a good idea or not, I'm not sure. I mean, sticking with today, do you think there's any particular areas of medicine um, that we're going a little bit too far on? Society isn't always prepared for the advances that science is making. I think society as a whole takes a while to catch up with ideas and uh, to catch up with those and have those debates about whether we should and how we should use the science. Science in itself isn't necessarily good or bad, but what you do with it can be very good or it can be very bad, and there's a whole spectrum in between. So I think it's a shame that there is, it seems to be a disconnect between the gen general public and scientific advance, and I would hope that we can engage the public more in science so that we can have those informed debates about what we do with medical advances and whether we should be doing them. And just to kind of wrap things up in a nice little bow, I mean, do you think uh, after someone reads your book, Making the Monster, I mean, do you, is there a particular notion that, that you want the reader to walk away with? I would like people to appreciate that Mary Shelley, she wrote a cracking story. It's a good read, Frankenstein. But actually, I would hope that they would appreciate that there's an awful lot more to it, not just from a literary point of view, but from a scientific point of view. And give her some credit for her insight and foresight in science. Is that a big idea? I know you also do lectures on, on the book that just came out. Um, is that something that you, you touch on as well in your presentations? Oh, absolutely. I'm all, um, I don't think, because it's fiction, I don't think people um, appreciate perhaps the work that Mary Shelley might have put into writing it. She read up on her um, Humphrey Davy. She knew her chemistry. She must have talked to her husband about electrical experiments. Maybe she talked about to, talked to this doctor about his experiences of digging up dead bodies or, or cutting them up. So she did her homework and it, like with my first book um, uh, about Agatha Christie and poisons, people read Agatha Christie and think, oh yeah, that's a nice story. She was really good on her science, and you wouldn't think of Mary Shelley and Agatha Christie as science communicators, but in many respects, I think they are, um, and I think they deserve credit for that. And you're just another fantastic one in a long line of female science communicators. Uh, we need a lot more of you out there. Um, plus, it's also English. You're English, so that helps, too. I can listen to that accent all day. Uh, <laughs> but if someone wants to hear that uh, accent in person, uh, share some of your social media info so people can follow up on there. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm uh, Rotwang's Robot, which if you get the the Frankenstein connection to my Twitter handle, all credit to you. Um, it's a very obscure reference. Uh, yes, so do follow me on there, and uh, I have a website, harcop.co.uk, which tells you if you're in the UK at all. I occasionally uh, leave my house and talk about science, and you're very welcome to come along and hear me. And I hope you come over uh, this side of the pond. Uh, you, you look me up when you do. Um, <laughs> Uh, just go. Uh, do you have a, and also give out your website? I'm not sure. Did you bring out your website? Um, 
it's parkup.co.uk. All right. Not trying to trick anyone. I like it. I appreciate it. All right. Hopefully I didn't uh, do too terrible of a job where you want to feel like poisoning me uh, now. So. Oh, uh, no, no, no. I wouldn't dream of it. I think my Google history, um, I would get found out rather too quickly. <laughs> but why is my throat tight? My throat's tightening a little bit right now. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, but no, seriously, it has been an absolute pleasure, Doctor. I, I really thank you so much for talking about your book, Making the Monster. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's been a great pleasure. We'll be right back with Ira Pastor, CEO of life science company BioCork, who is a real-life Victor Frankenstein working with life science company BioCork, giving people a second chance at life. He's going to share some of that knowledge on their cutting-edge science in regeneration and reanimation. And if you don't join us in the final hour, I am going to have our first hour guest, Dr. Catherine Harkup, poison you. Don't move an inch, or maybe you can't because that's the toxins in your body right now. Either way, we'll see you shortly. You're listening to The Mind's Eye.